at the start line, Curtis White here from the Israels and Snow end up there dropping it. And ready to go here in Brazena, and we are underway. Van der Poel alongside Curtis White, Tonart right alongside him, and it's the American that gets a hold of the ball. That was around the end, and on the last day. The coffee tasted good this morning. Kai's got a new podcast in the red. To see him with such a great start today, I know a lot of American fans are going to be really pumped by this. Hello, everyone, and welcome back in the red. I'm your host, Curtis White. I'm here with my friend, Tony Seiler. And I'm really sorry, guys, but it's been a while since we recorded last. We recorded after the last race in Falmouth, Massachusetts, and we took some time off around Thanksgiving. We're able to enjoy some home time, time at home with our families. Um, And just for me, training and preparing for the next couple of races. So it's been a pretty quiet time, but uh, I'm excited to get back to recording. So. Tony, it's been a while. How are you doing? Good. It's it's been nice to have some some downtime, but um, I'm looking forward to talking about racing again. Certainly been watching the racing that I can. The the European racing is is heating up, so that's been exciting. I'm excited to talk about that, and I'm excited to hear about last weekend. Obviously, we didn't have any TV coverage, so uh, you're going to fill us in on all the Pan Am goodness. Yeah, I, I I know it's I, I think you're getting you've gotten pretty spoiled with being able to watch all the racing uh, that's been going on here in the U.S. Uh, with yeah. the USCX series and all those races are still on GCN. If you haven't watched those or you just want to watch them again, definitely go on to GCN and you can rewatch some exciting racing that happened on in the U.S. earlier this year. But uh, we have had a couple weekends recently where there hasn't been any TV coverage, so all we have had is some of the highest level racing in the world over in Europe, again, shown on GCN or wherever you watch the world cups. Um, that's all we've really had lately. Yeah. Kind of lame, huh? Just, just <laughs> those, just those fast guys over there, but that's all changing. Cause we're going to watch, we're going to watch Nats. That's going to be covered. Um, we're going to watch the curse period when, when you get over there. So we're going to see racing there and we're going to see mm-hmm. worlds. So lots of coverage ahead of us here. Yep. Um, I'm hoping I, I thought, I think Nats is on, flow though is is that correct correct yes uh to watch the u.s national championships you gotta go through flow bikes sign up or watch it through flow bikes uh they'll have all the coverage for the elite races uh for that weekend all right well i'm hoping that's gonna work because i tell you about my flow conspiracy oh no i think i think i I feel like we we haven't had enough conspiracy theories on this show so i think now's the time to start no, this is legit, man. This is legit. I think they heard me talking trash about them and about the cost and about how little guy from Slow Ride stole me 75 bucks for his half of my subscription. And I think that they <laughs> caught on to that because when I turned on Flow the other day and tried to watch one of the World Cups, the only thing that I could get to play was an interview with Kerry Werner over and over and over again. I couldn't get his face off my TV. I think they did it to me on purpose. And I think Carrie's in on it. That's my that, conspiracy. That sounds like a nightmare. It was. It was horrific. <laughs> it was really bad. I just had to see him talking over and over and over. I don't know, man. I if if Carrie and Flow Bikes are both in on it, I think that that's a pretty that that I, I'd be more impressed at that point. I would be super impressed. That would be the best prank ever. Like I hope that they did that to me on purpose. I hope that they intentionally froze my coverage to just see Carrie Warner. Because that would, I, my hats would be off. I would up my subscription uh, every single year. Me and little guy, we're going to pay the, the fee every single year together. I, I, I can just imagine the Carrie and Flow Bikes in the back room just kind of, you know, <laughs> conspiring over how, how we're going to get the co host of In the Red. Yeah. How, how are we going to get them this week, guys? I know. I know. We got, we got a lot of weight on this show, you know? Well, thanks to our loyal listeners and new listeners who have been able to help us generate momentum and help us grow the show over really the last year. It's been uh, pretty exciting. And, you know, it, we've already been doing this show for about a year now. Um, I know. It's been a lot of fun. And it's really the, the reason why we got into recording this show was last year during the, the pandemic when we didn't have racing here in the U.S., I was one of the few athletes to go to Europe and to be able to compete at the highest level. Um, there weren't a lot of Americans over there, and this is kind of our way to connect with uh, my American fan base or just uh, American racers or just people who love this sport and want to follow it. Th- this was my way of connecting with 
those listeners uh, and telling everyone what it was like, what the races were like. We were analyzing all those races and we kept it going through the summer. And then now we were able to uh, record some really good shows and follow the U S scene, which is, I was really excited to see the U S races bounce back. The U S season now is really just about over. We have one last weekend, the national championships uh, this coming weekend in just outside of Chicago. Um, and then myself and all the other Americans and my Cannondale teammates were shipping off to Europe. Um, and we're going to finish our season over there. And then actually that's not true. The U S season isn't over. We're going to come back to the U S for the world championships. Right. Not for a February season, but for the world championships. Right. Hey, that that's uh, piggybacking off of Bill's idea. One <laughs> of the ideas you're going to hate, I want February cross races here in the U S. Oh, all right. Well, what, We'll have to put that on the list. You can put that on your your Christmas list, February cross races. Yeah. But but I do I am excited about the the next stretch here. This is this is where it really gets exciting, um, both in terms of of just more on the line in in the U.S. scene, um, and of course we saw Wout return, we saw Pickcock return, uh, Vanderpool's supposedly coming back very soon. I mean, I don't know how you can't get excited about that. They're the three best bike racers in the world, uh, at least in terms of all around bike racer, right? And yeah coming in a race it's amazing yeah did you watch boom this last weekend i did i did it was uh, uh i i can't believe he beat him that badly i mean my god it's like it was like right out of the gate yeah well <clears throat> th those conditions are really made for wow um if you you go back to the dendermonda world cup last year and it was he and vanderpoel were going head to head and it was that those heavy tractor pull conditions and wow just rode away from it so to say he's he's a bigger guy, he has a lot of horsepower, and those are the conditions he can really thrive in. Um, and if you look at his Strava, you'll see he's been doing a lot of we call them endurance cross rides, um, where it's just riding trails all day, and it's not really repetitive work. You're kind of kind of having these adventure rides. You're going all over the place and finding new trails, but um, really just kind of going into uncharted territory and exploring on the cross bike and he's been doing a lot of those rides just to get the technique back get the finesse, the finesse back um you know it seems like the work has really paid off for him uh, yeah he, he just continues to be impressive all three of those guys do um obviously we haven't seen what Vanderpool will do but i'm sure i'm sure it'll be impressive and there's been such good battles leading up uh to his return and the racing has been really exciting and then he just comes in and just decimates it uh, yeah, it, I, I thought level. Pickcock would be a little bit better, um, yeah. but it's again, it's he's human, right? It, it's the first cross race back. It's a pretty heavy track with a lot of mud. It's a very technical race, and there there was one point in the race where you could kind of see the, you know, the he he didn't have the momentum. He was starting to he he was making a lot of mistakes. He slipped. He had two crashes, and I think in his post race inter interview he called himself a numpty yeah. where he, he said it's you know every, the first race back you always feel like a bit of a numpty and i was always I, I started wondering like what's a numpty you know i could just see like the queen of england 300 years ago calling someone you know one of the peasants a numpty <laughs> I, I just feel like that's one of those phrases that's been around for four or five hundred years and somehow it's come back into the fold and into cycling media and now everyone's wondering what a numpty is i feel like i can guess what a numpty is but uh, that's the first time I've ever honestly heard that phrase. Yeah, I, it was it was a new word for me too. I might start breaking it out though. And you're an English teacher. I know I am an English <laughs> teacher, and I I did not know that word. So uh, you learn something new every day, right? Yeah, I, I suppose so. But uh, yeah, let's dive into the last month here. We the last time we recorded uh, it was after the really rad cyclocross festival in Falmouth. We had a couple weekends off. We saw the racing go on in North Carolina, uh, the North Carolina GP. I was not there for that weekend. I decided to stay home and train. And then we had Thanksgiving and it was a nice quiet period. Um, and I think that you saw a lot of athletes kind of hunkering down, staying home and uh, just sticking to the grind. Um, and, and there wasn't a lot going on in the U.S. That was really the, the one downtime that we've had this season. Was that good for you? I mean, do you, do you feel like you needed at that point in the season, especially the, the travel and the intensity that led up to it and what you, you know, the travel and intensity you're about to, to dive into? 
I, I needed it and that it, not that I needed the rest, but that was the period to sharpen the sword. Um, that's, that's the period where I'm, I'm really dialing in my process every day matters. And it's not, I'm not going to win a championship by one killer workout. You win a championship by stringing together 30 really solid, strong sessions in a row. And that's just what I had to do. I, I was really, I was looking at the whoop numbers, what my recovery was. I was trying to get in the green every day. I was really monitoring my health and really measuring my workouts. I wasn't, you know, if the weather was amazing one day, I, I had to make sure that I wasn't going uh, over the limit to where I, I, I couldn't repeat that workout again the next day. So I was, every day was very measured and calculated. And I wanted to make sure that I was getting in good quality work. Um, and the days are getting shorter. It's getting colder. The weather's getting nastier. So you had to get a little bit more creative with how you were getting in the work. Um, whether it's making the running, uh, the running sessions are a little bit longer in the morning or spending a little bit more time in the trails uh, to stay off the roads when it's really cold and windy out or even the days that it's, it's raining and 40 degrees, you still have to get out there and get the work in. Um, and that's a prime opportunity to really practice the skills. It, even today, I was out on the trails and we woke up to some pretty it was raining last night. It was a pretty nice day weather-wise, but the trails were slick and that's a prime opportunity to go out and really train the skills and just be sharp technically. Um, every day, just looking to improve in one little area and just making sure you're able to repeat those efforts day after day after day. You're not looking to have this monstrous one-day training session to, you know, that's how you're going to win a championship. You need to be measured and calculated and string together a number of these sessions. And that's where you start to absorb the fitness and, um, you know, and you look at these larger trends, like I've been using whoop as a tool for that. That's where that tool has been very helpful, where you could see trends over the course of several weeks or the, over the course of a month. And you could say, this is how I'm absorbing the fitness or the training. I know this is working. How do, how do you feel you fare in uh, colder, harsher weather conditions? Is that something, I mean, I know you want to be, you know, able to compete in everything and all that kind of good stuff, but like, uh, do you, do you favor that weather? Do you not favor that weather? Do you feel like you hold up well? I mean, I feel like different guys have different preferences. Uh, where do you fall on that? I love it when the weather gets nasty. And I mean, it's cyclocross athletes are very unique in that we, we love to boast that we always race in any condition that's thrown at us. But, you know, you, you hear some folks on the side that say, oh, well, you know, racing in the hot isn't cyclocross weather or racing in you know when it's all ice isn't cyclocross weather and people get oddly picky about it and you don't have that luxury as a cyclocross athlete you need to be very well rounded you need to make sure you're doing all of the the, the body work the strength and conditioning the running the interval work and then also the technical work in every condition so if the weather's getting bad and it's snowing outside that's a great opportunity to go out and test riding in the snow um we're, we're actually seeing that uh the the uci they're getting ready for the world cup in val de soleil this weekend i believe um and that's a test event to show that they can do a cyclocross race on all snow and ice to try and put in a bid for the winter olympics I, that that's awesome um so i mean you have to be good in that you have to constantly be putting yourself in uncomfortable situations and pushing the technique and I think over the years, I've really enjoyed racing when the conditions are at their worst. Uh, I think over the last couple of years, we knew that nationals was going to be in Chicago or was supposed to be in Chicago last year. And there's been all this hype about racing in Chicago in December and how nasty it's going to be. Um, and, and I think there's been a lot of mental preparation around that. Um, but we're looking at the weather now for this coming weekend, and it doesn't look as terrible as a lot of people have been talking about. Um, we were seeing that it's 80% chance of rain on Friday, uh, temperatures, you know, it gets down to 20 degrees at night and then 40, 45 degrees during the day. So there's a prime opportunity for the course to freeze then thaw out, maybe get muddy and torn up. We'll just have to wait and see. So I'm not overthinking what the conditions are going to be like. I don't want to project what it could be. Uh, we'll just have to wait and see what it's going to be like when we get there. You go back to that Olympic question or, or concept uh, as an athlete. I, I mean, maybe it's a dumb question, but um, how, how important is that to you? Or would that be to you 
to have that opportunity to race cycle cross in the Olympics. Is that something you've given a lot of thought to? Uh, it would be a tremendous opportunity, just uh, not just for myself, but for the sport. Because I think the one thing that the cyclocross is really, really uh, struggling with is that we're not an Olympic discipline. And you see it with the attention that's been given to versus uh, track or mountain bike or road, all these other or BMX, these other Olympic disciplines and cyclocross, in my opinion, and this is just my passion for the sport cyclocross has this unique ability to be more spectator friendly in my opinion than any other discipline to be able to interact with the athletes and you know watch them face to face as they're racing and then in a park setting see 70 80 percent of the course from one vantage point um and just the general environment the atmosphere that a cyclocross race brings like you can't you can't replicate that in another discipline um, and, and I, it should be an Olympic discipline. It should be in the Olympics. Um, I, I've heard both sides of the argument about whether it should be in the summer Olympics or winter. And to be honest, I, I wouldn't mind it in the summer Olympics because it's again, in cyclocross, we pride ourselves in racing in any condition that's thrown at us. Um, and cyclocross did start off as this winter sport where, all the road racers or the mountain bikers came and raced it in the off season to stay fit and work on their technique and their, their, their fitness. And they, they were able to train through the winter and kind of get something out of it. Now, over the last 20 years, we've had more cyclocross specialists um, or people who are only focusing on cyclocross and dabble in mountain biker road just to stay fit, to prepare for cyclocross. And we're racing cyclocross when it is 80 degrees and sunny or dry. Um, we were doing that this past weekend in Texas, it was 75 degrees, sunny and dusty. Um, it's going to be very different for the rest of the season. I, I guarantee when we go to Belgium, it's, it's going to be 40 degrees and raining for most of the days and races, but it's, I mean, those are the conditions that are thrown at us. All right. So let's talk about last weekend. Um, we're going to pull up a video here, um, that we're going to kind of use to follow the racing. So uh, for people listening, if you want to watch along with this, it's some great content from uh, our friends at the Wide Angle Podium. Um, I believe uh, Michael Bodenheimer put this video together. It's, it's real good. Gives us some of the, the racing um, and some of the footage that we weren't able to see. So uh, we're going to play it here. You guys can play it if you're in an opportunity to do so, or if not, you can just watch it on your own time. And this will give Curtis a little opportunity to talk about uh, some of the racing it's condensed it's only five minutes off highlights but uh here you can you can kind of walk us through curtis and tell us what you saw so uh here we go we'll give it a play yeah so i mean before we really dive into this course it's um i didn't do a course preview uh for this race um but it's a really fast flowing course kind of there, there's ex this extreme of going through the woods this technical fast bit kind of felt like a bmx track and then these wide open power straights um, we had a short sand pit earlier in the lap, uh, but it wasn't all that difficult to ride through it. Most of the people, or most of the people were riding through it. You had to really muscle the bike towards the end. Um, we, then we had these fast whoop sections in the woods, very single file, very difficult to pass. Um, and if someone stalled in front of you, uh, it, it was a, it was kind of a trouble point where you had to get off and run and that's when you lost time. Um, First lap, blistering fast. Scott McGill hits the front. Eric Bruner takes over. Um, as we're watching the recap here, we're halfway through the first lap. Uh, there was a group of about seven of us in total. Um, and the race really whittled down from there. Um, it, it was pretty clear that Eric Bruner was on a fast day and hats off to him. Um, because I feel like he's he's been good in these conditions. We raced in Falmouth, Massachusetts earlier this year very similar conditions where it was this really tight flowing uh, racing where you had these short reaccelerations that he was very good with and he was able to sustain the power. Um, yeah, again, so we're here in the video, second lap, uh, Bruner, like myself. Sand. Sand's pretty rideable for everybody. Didn't yeah, it was pretty it. rideable. It's, it was all about, you know, you lost your momentum towards the end, but if you rode it just right, you were able to really keep the, the momentum uh, through the pit. Um, 
but this this is a real roady course it felt like there was that technical bit in the woods you had to be cautious of uh but really we weren't getting off there, there were laps that we weren't getting off once because the barriers were hoppable the barriers were after uh, a couple uphill sections so you really you, you came into it in the red um <laughs> here we'll see in the video uh i believe this is the second lap uh i stalled over the first barrier and had to make a <laughs> abort the bunny hop and run the second barrier, but I was able to do it smoothly enough. Um, but it's, there, there were laps that we didn't get off the bike once. So it was very, very technical, all about driving the bike, making good decisions on the bike. Um, but here we'll see it on lap. This is lap three, I believe we're into the wood section. Here hits the banner you're running. So is that a, um, is that the same one that you guys are riding earlier? Or is that a different run up? That, that was the same one. So it's, that was one of the trickier ones where if someone stalled in front of you, you had to get off and that really chopped up your rhythm. There was uh, the first couple laps. If you were caught in traffic, I had to get off a couple of times, but it wasn't that difficult to ride. It was just difficult to ride in traffic or if someone stalled in front of you. So here we're coming in lap four, Bruner hit out off the front. Carrie opened up a slight little gap uh, and I had to jump around Carrie. Um, and it was just one of those things where Bruner was on a good day. He was able to open up a slight advantage and I don't think Kerry could hold that wheel and uh, that effort of having to jump around and bridge to Bruner, that was a big effort. And then I lost the wheel again in the wooded section. So that kind of, it was a, from that point, it was really a time trial trying to keep Bruner as close as I could. Um, there was a point where I was able to get close enough to Bruner again I think he dropped his chain in the woods or misshifted um, and the gap came back to about five seconds and at that point it was three laps to go bells and whistles are ringing like it's like that's my point to reconnect um, and I wasn't able to so it's it, he was riding strong he rode a good race that that's really all I can say about it yeah, it seems the the field's deep, which is which is exciting. It's gonna be exciting for next weekend to see that you know there's there's at least four or five guys here that could that could win. Um, but it seems like the courses do dictate a lot of that. We you know whether there's they're more road favor or more mountain bike favor or heavier. Um, I think if we go through, if we were you know the stats guys going through and really dissecting the wins this year from different riders, it seems like the courses have determined uh, or had a large hand in that as they play to strengths for different riders. Is that, you think that's true? Ooh, I, I like that Lance Car <laughs> Lance got that barrier. You see that he, he handled that. Well, I like the slow-mo on the editing too. That made that look cool. Yeah. Yeah, that was. Well, so again, there, there are these longer power straights that came up to the barrier. So it made the bunny hopping. You had to be very, uh, you, you had to make sure you were composed coming into the barriers or else you were going to slip or, you know, your toe was going to catch the barrier or you weren't going to bunny hop cleanly. So that, that was just one of those things you had to really gauge the effort right. But um, yeah, what you were saying earlier is we have seen different conditions and we've seen different riders really excel in Bruner's excelled in these dry, fast conditions where the course is really winding. Um, but when the conditions get tough, I think that he loses that advantage. And Kerry's a very good technical rider. I mean, you look at Cincinnati day one versus day two. Bruner was on fire when it was more of a dry track on the first day. And then when, when the conditions were at their worst and slippery and uh, the course got a bit heavier, it, it was Carrie and I, um, one, one person that wasn't up there who did have a good ride gauge hecked. Uh, he had a mechanical earlier on um, looking at his lap times. He still had some good lap times. So it's, I mean, he's fit right now. Um, and that, that, that's something that I really liked about having, a race the weekend before nationals is that we know where everyone's at now. You're not going to gain fitness over the course of the next five days uh, or five or six days. It's, you know, the chips are on the table. We know what's going on. All that there is is just, you know, show up ready to go on Sunday. Yeah. And it looks like it's deep. I mean, all these guys look real strong. You know, Scott McGill has been great on, on some, on certain courses and, and is interesting to watch. And, and Gage has had some really good days. He had a good day in the mud at the World Cup. Um, so, you know, it's like it, it's anybody's game. And that's, that's I think, from a fan perspective is what we want to see, you know, going in. I don't know if we've been in recent history, been in, going into a Nationals where this many, uh, we have this many different guys 
um, who can walk away with the win legitimately. So that's, uh, that's exciting. Yeah. I, I remember when I was coming into the sport, my first nationals was 2005. Um, I believe Todd Wells won in uh, the first year of Providence, Rhode Island. Um, and then the next year was Ryan Chabon. And then uh, I, I believe Kansas city, Tim Johnson, and then um, Chabon again, then John page and then powers. And that like, it, you had all these different names at the top of the sport at that time. And then we, I, I don't know what year it was, but then powers started to dominate. He mm -hmm. had his three championships in a row and then Hyde came into the picture and he had three championships in a row and then gauge won the last championship in 2019. So it's, we we've, it's, it's been a while since we've had four or five names at the top of the sport. And I, I've said this a couple of times, whether it's on this podcast or in different interviews, but I have noticed this year that, uh, on the men's side, the Americans have really stepped up uh, their game and it's, it's made the racing more exciting, I think. Uh, so it's, it, it's good to see. I think that paired with having some of the races covered on GCN and being televised that they've been able to showcase those races and the excitement that um, we, the athletes are able to bring in the, the teams and the sponsor, like, all, all of that excitement is there. Um, so it's, I, I think there are, uh, the fans have a lot of exciting racing coming up this weekend. Um, yeah, it's, so it's great. I, I'm excited. Yeah, I'm, to, I'm really excited to be a part of it and to, to give it my all. I'm looking forward to seeing that transition to Europe too and to the racing over there. Um, but it is as much as I want to see you win every race by three minutes. Um, it is nice to see uh, that depth and that level of competition and the way that the courses bring out strengths on different riders. And, you know, it says a lot about all those guys out there um, and how hard you guys work and, and the quality of racing. So mm -hmm. hopefully there'll be a really, really good battle uh, next weekend. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, I think that that's a guarantee. All right. All right. So what else we got to know, man? Um, it's a, uh, it's you know, it's the exciting part of the year. So how are you feeling? How, how's how's how are you how are you mentally? Are you, uh, you you locked in? Are you lighthearted? Like like what do you take into this part of the year as you're looking at um, some really intense racing coming up? Yeah. Um, I, I'm, I'm at peace with my preparation. Um, I'm very happy with the work that I've done. Um, <clears throat> it, it November has been a very good time to, you know, we, we had a couple of races close to home and I was able to train through those, get some good results, um, traveling out to Texas. I mean, it, it's, it's been, it's been a good period and it's just, I'm not just focused on Pan Ams and nationals. It, I was also really preparing for my, european campaign we're going to be over there for a month um all the way up through the world cup in flamenville and then coming back home to the u.s and prep in preparation for the world championships in arkansas so it's uh i i'm very happy with the work that i've put in how consistent i've been uh staying on top of my health on top of my training the recovery the sleep the nutrition all of these pieces that we athletes were trying to piece together on a daily basis, I feel like I've been able to stick to my process and that that's just the physical side. And then the mental side too, just being able to bring my best mentally into every day and get the most out of every training session, or, you know, whether it's a race effort, if I, if I don't win, taking the positives out of that effort, um, and being able to improve on the things I need to, um, I, I, I feel yeah. Again, I, I feel at peace coming into this coming weekend. I'm not overthinking a lot of it. I'm, I'm very happy with how I, how I've been operating. Um, and, and I was happy with the, I wasn't happy with the result this past weekend, but I was happy with how I raced it. I think there was very little else I could have done. Um, when Bruner decided to go, it was the, it was on the section he needed to, I made a quick miss. I made a small mistake and had to put a foot down on the steep hill. And he was able to get six, seven bike lengths. And that was the gap. Um, you know, it wasn't like there was this massive, you know, the, the, this flaw that I have or something that I need to really adjust in the next week. I don't really need to adjust anything. I feel like, so yeah, I'm very happy with that. I'm at peace with where my form is, where I'm at mentally. And uh, it's just all the work is done. Now it's time to just go out and enjoy. And, and do what I love, which is competing at the highest level. 
Yeah. I like the way the pressure is really spread too right now. Um, you know, I know I, I'm sure you're feeling some pressure uh, and Carrie kind of nope. similar. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I know you'll never admit to it, but like you and Carrie both, both need to, you know, want to win one um, here. Gage has got pressure to defend. Bruner was coming in thinking he didn't have much pressure as sort of the underdog, but he won last weekend. So bro, you got pressure now. Um, so uh, I, I like that dynamic. I think that's exciting. Um, and I don't expect you to dive into that. You know, maybe we'll talk about that, you know, a couple of weeks down the road, but, uh, but I do, I do like that as a fan. I like being able to look at that and go, you know what? I know all these guys got a level of pressure that they're, that they're wrestling with, but they're all wrestling with it. So I think that really raises the stakes too. So it's, it's an exciting, exciting time. Um, and, uh, you know, looking forward to that happening. Anything about racing in Europe that's got you that you just really love and you're looking forward to getting back to? I know you love being in Europe. So what's the, what's the, any one thing that you're like, man, I just can't wait for this. Um, yeah, I, I do love racing over there and it's, it's been kind of strange last year was my first full season that I spent over there. It was three months, but that was the maximum limit that we could be over there for. And, uh, doing all those races. I, I just, I love that environment and being able to, to be with the best in the world. You're always around people who are better than you and you're constantly learning. Even if you had a bad race, there are, a dozen things that you could identify that, okay, this is something that, or, or, or an area that someone else was better than me. And I was able to identify this and follow their wheel for a little bit, or, um, that, there's all sorts of areas. Um, but it looks like the fans are back at the races, um, in Belgium. And I'm excited to have that environment back, uh, back over there in Europe and just get, getting back over and, we had a really nice routine and set up and centered where we always stay in the Netherlands. It's five kilometers or seven kilometers from the, the Belgian border um, next to Maastricht. And it's just, I, I, that's, that area has really been a home away from home for me. I've really grown to enjoy that area. I've spent a lot of holidays over there, which is, it's, it can be difficult to be away from family during the holidays. I really enjoyed staying home for this past Thanksgiving, but um, you know, I've been away for, I think, this may be my my tenth Christmas um, away from home. There, you know, and it's it, that that's a big investment uh, for myself, but also my family to support that and be okay with me being away during a, uh, that time of year. But uh, their support and helping me continue to pursue this passion uh, as an athlete it's it's huge. So just for that, I'm looking to get the most out of it um, and just enjoy it as much as I can. Cool. Yeah. Looking forward to watching it. I enjoyed so much going through it with you last year and getting to experience it that way where we got to talk about it every week that it's just makes it even more exciting for me this year to, to be able to do that again. I hope people will be listening for it. So uh, a lot of good stuff ahead. I guess one other thing ahead, I didn't even think I told you about yet, but we should, we should hint at this. We can't give all the details yet, mm -hmm. but I'll give you the date. You know the date, but um, we're looking at uh, putting a little New York gravel race together in may and i think we got a, a date of may 22nd um i did the course recon a couple weeks ago um it's gonna be fun uh so i'm excited for that event we're doing we're doing some work on that we're gonna announce it officially here in the next couple of weeks wow but that that that's really exciting what what part of new york is this event is it like in the finger lakes region right in the finger lakes region it's gonna take a little of the old prattsburg gravel course that you've raced before we got some features there uh, we're going to do it with our friends at Stu Ben Brewery, uh, who have are the home of the New York Curtis Cyclocross Pilsner, where you could get in the green that way as well. Um, and uh, we did some course recon. It's like a, it's a new course completely that we've used, although we use some of the old features. And it's like a 45 mile plus cyclocross race. It's hard. It's punchy. It's nasty. Um, it's got some cool views, some really cool features. So I'm looking forward to getting more hard or uh, concrete uh, information out pretty soon, but I'm excited for it. I'm excited to see you race it in May. Yeah, I'm really excited for that too. And ah, uh, oh man, it, it, the guys at Steuben, they're probably going to be on their like sixth or seventh batch of of the New York Curtis Cyclocross Pilsner. Oh yeah, yeah, there'll be plenty of that. I think <laughs> I think we're going to be giving that out for podium prizes. We're going to be drinking that afterward. It's in brewery. high demand, folks. Oh yeah, it's going to be a good one. May twenty. There, there have been a number of New York races that we've been able to give that out as podium prizes, or just kind of get people in the community, uh, just showing them that there's this product, but also there's there's been a lot of interest in it. So I, I've been enjoying just kind of sharing my story through that outlet, um, and I'm really excited to have that gravel event 
uh, out there. And it's close to m- where I grew up in, uh, in upstate New York. Yeah. Beautiful. Right on Cuba Lake, the brewery overlooks the lake. So that'll be the start finish. Um, so lots of details to come, but if you guys who are listening are planning your, your race schedule and you like short, hard, punchy, 45 mile ish gravel races that will beat the crap out of you, but not spend 12 hours out racing. Um, this is for you. It's a cycle cross race mixed with a mountain bike race mixed with a road race, uh, in a way that is super fun. So, yeah, it'll be a lot of fun. Well, uh, a little bit of tidbit news here too. Uh, the lifetime grand prix series was just announced uh, a couple of weeks ago and I have officially thrown my hat in the ring, uh, for Thanks. that series. So we are, uh, we're still waiting. Uh, I think applications are still open or they're looking at applications now. And uh, who is going to be, it's 20 men, 20 women, a part of this series. So whoever will be a part of it, that'll be announced shortly. Um, So if I am accepted, I will have to be preparing for a 12 hour gravel event. So maybe I'll just tack on like six hours before um, we do this gravel event in May. Maybe we'll make that the race. Maybe, maybe you have to do like six laps and everybody else has to do one of that, uh, of that 45 mile loop. Yeah. There's probably more elevation gain and well, it's, I don't know how, like how much elevation there is at unbound. I mean, it's 200 miles. There's probably, there's several thousand feet of climbing, but there's one, you know, certainly there's probably about as much elevation in all of unbound as there is. in like, 30 miles of the course that you have yeah we got almost five thousand feet in 45 miles so but the descents make it worth it that's that's what i I like the uh, i like the technical descents they're dicey well i remember uh, there are there are a couple years where anthony clark and jeremy powers came out and we were just like full gas like down these descents it was was so much fun and both of the i mean especially jeremy is such a a technically proficient rider that it was really fun to follow his wheel and be on the limit and there were some points where i I thought i thought we were both going down and he was able to hold it upright and i I was i was flailing a little bit more but um yeah it's it's definitely a great area to ride and uh i'm excited for that event yeah it's gonna be good we got lots of good stuff ahead. Yeah. And excited for the recovery beverages afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's, that's my whole race. I, I, I drive around in the truck and make sure everything's good. And then I get to the recovery beverages. So yeah. I got, I got the best of both worlds. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Tony. Well, that's all I have. Um, anything on your end? That's it. Looking yeah. forward to this weekend. Looking forward to chatting with you after this weekend. Yeah. Absolutely. This is a bit of a shorter episode, but uh, yeah, again, you know, we're coming off a big training block through, through November Pan Am's only the one day of racing there and then in the national. So there really isn't much to talk about. Um, I hope all of you listening are able to follow along on flow bikes, watching the race. Um, will there be a watch party at Steuben on Sunday? Um, not for this one. Um, we're looking maybe for world. So, um, but yeah. And hopefully my flow bikes works. I might have to go to Steuben to see it if they keep freezing my account with Carrie's face. <laughs> well, well, all right. Maybe we should release this episode after the race on Sunday, <laughs> just to make sure we, we don't want that. We, we know they're after you, Tony. Do you see flow bikes in the room right now? They, they might be listening. Yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> all right. Well, folks that's all i got um tony thanks again for talking that was really fun um before we leave i want to give everyone a quick reminder if you haven't done so yet please like share subscribe leave a comment wherever you listen to podcasts we're still trying to grow the show get more people involved and uh you know with all the algorithms out there that's how we do it so i really appreciate everyone's support uh and listening and sharing the show so that's all for this week next time we record it's after nationals So everybody take care, stay healthy, keep riding. Talk to you soon.